Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being our God, Lord. In a world that is so crazy, we find our peace in you, and we're so thankful for that. And Lord, we look forward to the things you're going to show us tonight. Keep our hearts open. Keep, them, keep us sensitive to your Spirit's leading, Lord. Uh, and Father, we just want to be more like you each and every day. We love you, Lord. We pray for our worship tonight, that as we sing unto you, our hearts and minds would be focused totally upon you so we could receive from you. We love you, and we thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9 as we continue our study through the Word of God. And this evening, we're going to finish up this powerful chapter that's showing us that Jesus is a better sanctuary. And we need to keep in mind as we're reading this letter who Paul is writing to. He's writing to Hebrews and specifically Jewish believers who were struggling with their faith, primarily because of the persecution they were facing. Uh, and this was at the hands of their fellow Jews, and most likely it was from their own family members. Once they came to Christ, their family disowned them. Also keep in mind that from childhood, they were taught the Old Testament scriptures. They knew what the temple was all about and all the sacrifices that were being offered. And so now there, here's this tug upon their lives to return to the old ways. And Paul's trying to say, hey, no, stay with Christ. Christ is superior to everyone and everything. Now, some may think, well, man, look at their lives. They gave so much up to come to Christ. And here's the thing we need to remember. He never asks us to give up anything without first offering something that is far better, right? We have eternal life with them. Is there anything better than that? We're going to spend eternity with the Lord. It is going to be joyous. Is it, are there struggles in this life? Absolutely. But weren't there struggles before we got saved? Absolutely. But now we have someone we can go to. We have the rock that we can place our feet upon so we're not moved. Oh, yeah, what I gave up was nothing. What Jesus gave up was everything to save me. And last week, we saw, looked at the earthly sanctuaries. We looked at the uh, first 10 verses of uh, Hebrews chapter 9. And the tab tabernacle, all the implements that were involved, the earthly service of the priest with the sacrifices they made. And it really culminated, culminated with the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And Paul's point was that all of this was only temporary. It was only a symbol or type of what was to come. In fact, the word symbolic in Hebrews 9.9 9 speaks of setting something side by side to make a comparison. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight and doing what Paul is sharing. Now, like I said, we looked at the Old Covenant, the tabernacle, and tonight it's going to be placed alongside the New Covenant, the tabernacle not made with hands, Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that Jesus is a better sanctuary. So let's pick up Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 11, and see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study through his word. Paul wrote this, But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. So Paul is making an obvious point here, but sometimes that needs to be done, kind of to awaken people, to get them thinking about what they're holding on to. And his point is really simple. You know, the tabernacle and the temple were made with human hands. We know that. That's obvious. God, yes, he provided the blueprints, how they were to be built, and what was to be placed inside the tabernacle, but man did the building. It was made from materials of this earth. And it was impressive. I mean, the Temple of Solomon and even what we call Herod's Temple were very, very impressive. More impressive, really, than the tabernacle. But the point being is they were only temporary. And he's comparing the old sanctuary with the new. The new sanctuary was not made by the works of man's hands, using materials of this earth, but God made it. And it's in heaven itself, the place where God dwells. And it was just a copy, the earthly tabernacle was just a copy of what the heavenly one was all about. That's what Stephen talked about as he was before the Sanhedrin, defending his faith. And in Acts 7, verses 45 through 50, this is what he said. 
Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the patterns that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? And again, Stephen is talking about the tabernacle. And he he, he talks also about Solomon's temple. And he makes the point that God doesn't dwell in temples made by hand. His dwelling place is in heaven. And Jesus, being our great high priest, has his sanctuary in heaven. And being king of kings, lord of lords, his throne or palace is also in heaven. Now, here's the problem. As limited as the earthly priests were, they could not take the common person into the holy place. The holy place was only for the priest. And the holy of holies Behind that veil, then, was only for the high priest and only once a year on the Day of Atonement. But we're told in the scriptures that Jesus takes us into the heavens. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6, Paul makes this point. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Yeah, we're seated in the heavens. That's where our citizenship is. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but man, this to me is just obvious today. This world is not my home. I'm sorry. I feel like an alien and stranger in it. All the violence, immorality, wickedness. I mean, look at the show that Netflix is putting out there with little kids that are like little prostitutes dancing around. Come on. This is not my home. My citizenship is in heaven. That's what Paul said in Philippians 3. He said, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Oh, I love that. This is not my home. I'm an alien stranger. I'm just passing through. My mission here as an ambassador for Christ is to bring people to Jesus, to reveal Jesus to them. And I eagerly wait for the Savior. Absolutely. I see the things that are going on in this world. Uh, You know, you see the commercials about the children's hospital and all these children that are sick and have cancer and some of them have died. And it breaks your heart and you go, Lord, I can't wait for the day when you return and set up your kingdom and all this stuff is done away with. This is not our home. And I don't think we're comfortable in it anymore. You know, Jesus, I think, is pictured here as our living tabernacle, not made with hands. That's what John said. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt could be tabernacled. God became flesh and dwelt in a human body. He tabernacled among us, a body that wasn't made with human hands. And this, is, this sanctuary, this tabernacle, later the temple, was just a copy of what the throne of God is like, what heaven is like. But again, the picture is, why are you going back to that stuff? Jesus is superior to all. Don't go back to it. Hold on to Jesus, or as Paul said earlier, anchor your life in Christ so why you don't drift away. And that's key. Paul's going to continue on with this comparison. Look at verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, 
But with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That is so important because the animal sacrifices were only a temporary covering of sin. They could not take away your sins. And Paul's going to continue to deal with that because that's an important factor. Why are you going back to those sacrifices which can't take away your sins? But Jesus can. He's the perfect sacrifice. And we can obtain eternal redemption. Can you lose your salvation? It's eternal, right? It's an eternal redemption. If that's not forever, then is heaven forever when we go to be with the Lord? Because that's eternal too. So you can't pick and choose and make your own definition to fit your own theology. This is an eternal redemption. It can't be taken away. And it was a sacrifice that was needed once for all. Think about that. Day in and day out, there were sacrifices being made. You had to do the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice. There were sacrifices, other sacrifices throughout the day. Why? Because these animal sacrifices couldn't take away your sins. But Jesus can and has. He cleanses our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. Oh, thank you, Jesus, right? Now, I love what the Lord said in Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I like the way the Living Bible translates it. It says, come, let's talk this over, says the Lord. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can take it out and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Even if you are stained as red as crimson, I can make you white as wool. God has the answer to the problem of sin, and it's found in Jesus. But you have to come to him. And I like the way the Lord says it. Let's talk about this. Let's reason together. Let's think about this. God doesn't say, you know, I don't want you thinking about this. You just just do it. No, let's talk this over. Your sins have separated you from me but I can set you free. I can cleanse you of your sin. I like that about our Lord. The old system was limited. But what Jesus gives us is not. It's eternal. It's finished. Or like Jesus said from the cross to Talistai, paid in full. You see, for these Jewish believers who were struggling, going back to this old system, this old covenant, Paul wants them to understand that the work that Christ completed on the cross of Calvary was secure. It was all en- an all-encompassing act of redemption. And I think the Holy Spirit wants us to understand that too because there's so much confusion today regarding what Christ has done and what we need to do. The work was completed. And the only thing we've added to salvation, and we have did add something to salvation, it's called sin. <laughs> You know, that's the only thing we added to it. We have not done anything to save ourselves. We just received the free gift of life that's found in Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. If the work is completed, can you make it better by adding something to it? No. You know, we talked about it before. You know, the Michelangelo's the David, right? It's a masterpiece. It's a work of art. What if I went up there, you know, it's a completed work, but what if I put some sunglasses on him? You know, put a little ring in his ear. Dressed him up a little bit. Would I make that work better? No, I would cheapen it. I'd make it worse. Well, that's what we do with Christ. If Christ said, the work is finished, it's completed, if I add anything to it, I'm saying, well, Jesus, you didn't really tell me the truth. I have to do some things. Absolutely not. And if you could add good works to it because, I guess if you wanted to, really then Paul's next point would be useless. Look at verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, 
how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Again, Paul wants them to think about what they're holding on to. And to do that, he wants them to think about those imperfect sacrifices that were made and how they couldn't take away a person's sins. Yes, it was sufficient for a time until the Messiah came. But now that he's come, why are you going back to that which is not sufficient? I mean, let's think about it for ourselves today. Have you read the book of Leviticus? I mean, we've gone through it. But do you want to practice that? I don't. I want to. I want Jesus. It's a finished work. But all the rules and regulations that God has established with the old covenant, I don't even know how they remembered them all, right? And they broke them all the time. So you offer an animal for your sins, and you go out and, you know, you start up your camel, and you're going down the road, and another guy on a camel cuts you off. And you're yelling at him, you know. And you got to go back and offer another animal sacrifice, right? It never ends. But with Christ, it has. And what Jesus has done, it's not just an external cleansing for us. He cleanses us inwardly. And that's the most important thing. The the Old Testament sacrifices are more of a ceremonial cleansing. But when what Jesus has done, it cleanses us inwardly. And then what Christ has done inwardly is manifested outwardly. Remember what Jesus said to the Jewish relig- religious leaders. They're like whitewashed tombs. There's dead men's bones in them. Why? Because they had this superficial holiness about them. They walked around with their long flowing robes and they came upon you and they would tuck their robes in because they didn't want to touch you because you were unclean, but they were holy men of God. And Jesus said, no, this is not outward action. This is an inward reality. And unless I get your heart and change it, you're fooling yourself. We're not cleaned up old creatures. We're a new creation in Christ. Wow. And because of that, we're to walk accordingly. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We need to remember that. Too many times people want to hold on to their past. Well, you know why I did that. I'm Italian, and I just got a bad Italian temper. Wrong. You're a new creation in Christ. Those old things are gone. You need to deal with that. That's a heart issue for you. See, the world problem is inside, isn't it? And only God can deal with that. And this whole thing with the ashes of the red heifer, these Jews knew exactly what Paul was talking about. They were very familiar with this. These ashes of the red heifer, you can read in Numbers chapter 19, but it deals with the remains of a burnt offering that was preserved and then sprinkled in the laver and used for washing to provide for ceremonial cleansing. And the point is, this was a shadow. The cleansing has come from Christ now. You don't need to use, you know, holy water or whatever because there's no value to it. And what's interesting, you know, the Jews today, the Orthodox Jews, most of the nation of Israel don't believe in the God of Israel. They, they, yeah, they they celebrate all the feasts and stuff, but it's kind of like people who don't believe in Jesus celebrating Christmas and Easter, right? That's just Israel for the most part. But the Orthodox Jew want to rebuild the temple. They want the temple sacrifices to begin again. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. They know that. And so this is a passion that they have. And they are in search for this red heifer, and it will be sacrificed, and its ashes then are going to be used to cleanse the priest, the new temple, and the temple implements. Why? So the sacrifices could be started up again. And Here's the thing, you know, they've been looking for this red heifer that's perfect, that doesn't, if it has one white hair, 
It can't be used. They don't have the temple or the permission to build the temple yet. So you can have a, you know, a red heifer that's perfect, but, you know, as it gets older, it's going to look like me. It's going to have that white hair, right? It's just the reality. So it's not the timing yet, but I know they will have it. And the Antichrist will make a covenant with them to rebuild the temple, and those sacrifices will start up again. This is not something that God is um, telling them to do. This is something they want to do. This is their own desire. And yeah, the scriptures tell us, but it's meaningless. Why? Because the perfect sacrifice has already come. Jesus has already come. He's paid the penalty for man's sins, for Jew and Gentile. There's not a different salvation for the Jew as for the Gentile. We're all saved by the blood of Christ. Now, what's interesting is Paul talks about this in verse 14, that God is going to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Well, first of all, the conscience that God has given to us is a really a wonderful gift, but it has its limitations. It's not perfect. It can be seared. Paul talked about it in 1 Timothy 4 too, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. In other words, you can sin over and over and over again, and your heart becomes so callous that it doesn't feel that what you're doing is wrong anymore. You know, I've been a, a, a diabetic now for 30-plus um, years, so I check my blood sugars on my fingers, and they get very calloused. I like to say because I'm a hard worker, but no, it's because I'm sticking my finger for blood all the time, and you lose the sensation. And that's what Paul's talking about with the heart. It can be seared. That's why people can do the most outrageous things. And you go, how could you do that? Because they seared their conscience with a hot iron. They don't feel it's wrong anymore. It also can be defiled. Titus 1.15 to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. You know, as you move away from the things of God, that which is pure, you're going to go after the things of the world, which are impure. They'll defile us. And lastly, our conscience can be evil, Hebrews 10.22. Where Paul wrote, let us draw near with a new, true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So again, as we move away from God, we're moving towards evil and the heart's wicked. We need to be careful. Draw close to God. Be in his word. Now here's the thing. I mean, it's wonderful that Jesus has paid in full the debt we owed for all our sin. And yet, we do remember them, don't we? We let what we have done in the past hold us back from what God wants to do in the present. And I think it's a problem for us today. You know, we struggle with this issue of forgiveness. How could God forgive me? Look what I did. If that's where you're at this evening, or, you know, for those that are listening on the internet or the radio station, Receive the forgiveness that God has for you that's found in Jesus. He paid the price. We are forgiven. I'll share this story with you, and you kind of see what I mean about some things we just can't let go. And yet Paul said that, you know, he's pressing on. Those things he's done in the past, there's nothing he can do about, but he's going to press on towards that upward calling. And that's what we need to do. Repent, get right, and move forward. Albert Speer was once interviewed about his last book on ABC's Good Morning America. And Speer was the Hitler confidant whose technological genius was credited with keeping Nazi factories humming throughout World War II. In another era, he might have been one of the world's industrial giants. He was the only one of 24 war criminals tried in Nuremberg who admitted his guilt. And he spent 20 years in, Spandu prison, in a Spandu prison. The interviewer referred to a passage in one of Spears' earlier writings. You have said the guilty can never be forgiven, or shouldn't be. Do you still feel that way? The look of despair, sorrow on Spears' face was wrenching as he responded. 
I served a sentence of 20 years, and I could say, I'm a free man. My conscience has been cleared by serving the whole time as punishment. But I can't do that. I still carry the burden of what happened to millions of people during Hitler's lifetime, and I can't get rid of it. This new book is part of my atoning of clearing my conscience. The interviewer pressed the point. You really don't think you're able to clear it totally? And he shook his head. I don't think it's possible. For 35 years, he had accepted complete responsibility for his crimes. His writings were filled with contrition and warnings to others to avoid his moral sin. He desperately sought punishment and to no avail. And how sad, because here's the thing for this man and for anyone, forgiveness is available in the blood of Jesus Christ. Coming to Christ would be like being born again. He literally could have had a new conscience without the slightest sense of lingering guilt. And some go, well, how can that be? How can he be forgiven of all the crimes against humanity that he did? He should feel guilty. He should feel bad. Well, here's the thing. Did Jesus just pay for some sins? Is there some, maybe your sin is less than his? No, he paid it all. All of our sins were nailed to the cross of Calvary, and by his shed blood, the penalty for our sins were paid in full. And for those who don't know Jesus, they need to repent and ask him into their lives. For believers, that forgiveness is already there. You have to accept it and walk accordingly. And when Paul speaks here of, of dead works, is he talking about sin or a work salvation? I, I think they go kind of go hand in hand. Sin is the problem, and what's man's solution to the problem of sin? I just got to be a better person. I just got to do more good things. No, that's not that's man's solution, but that's not right. And Paul's saying it's never going to happen. If we're going to work our way into heaven, do you think we need to know how much work we need to do? Wouldn't that be a good idea? Because I need to know that I'm getting into heaven. And if I have to work my way in, how much do I have to do? Well, the Bible never tells us why. Because Jesus says, this is the work. Believe. There is the work. Believe. And you could never be assured of getting into heaven by your good works but we can because of the blood of Jesus. And I'll tell you right now, you'll never get into heaven by good works. Not at all. John 5, 24, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. So if I repent of my sins and I come to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I can have everlasting life. Wow. Again, pretty important. How long is everlasting life? It's everlasting. Okay? I am not a smart guy, and I have a hard time with abstract concepts. Okay? So when the Bible talks about eternity, I have a hard time with that because I live in a time-space continuum here, right? I know what day it is, what month it is, what year it is, although I want to get rid of the year, but I can't do that. We still got a few months to go in it. But, and so I know time, but there is no time in heaven. None of us will have Garmin watches or Fitbit watches in heaven, right? We are not going to be looking and what time it is, because there is no time. I don't have that concept. All I know and understand is, I'm going to be with Jesus forever. Okay, so I don't know the, the, the details of what that's going to be like. I don't have to. I will have forever to be with him. Praise the Lord for that. I like that about our God. So when we put our trust in him, our conscience is at ease knowing 
Our salvation isn't based upon what I have done, but what he has done. It's not based on my faithfulness to maintain it, but his. Spurgeon said, Dear friends, do keep in mind that you are henceforth to serve the living God. You are that acquainted with the Greek. You that are acquainted with the Greek will find that the kind of service here mentioned is not that which the slave or servant renders to his master, but a worshipful service such as a priest render unto God. We that have been purged by Christ are to render to God the worship of a royal priesthood. It is ours to present prayers, thanksgivings, and sacrifice. It is ours to offer the incense of intercession. It is ours to light the lamp of testimony and furnish the table of showbread. Wow. Jesus is superior to everything, guys. Look at verse 15. And for this reason, he's the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. How many times are we seeing this word eternal, right? It's pretty important. Let me ask you this question. Because some have a hard time with this. How were the Old Testament saints saved? Again, People struggle with that, but we need to understand. Some would say, well, by works. They kept the law, right? No, that's not how they were saved. Not by works. How were they saved? Well, Romans 4, verse 19 through 22, the faith of Abraham. Paul said, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. Already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. You see, he was saved by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the coming Messiah. That's where his faith was at. And once, you know, the tabernacle was built and later the temple... They obeyed by faith, still looking forward to the coming Messiah. And after the death of Jesus on the cross at Calvary, where did he spend three days and three nights? Oh, in the belly of the earth. In the place known as Abraham's bosom, where those who died in faith waited for the Messiah and they were comforted by Abraham. And now the Messiah has come. And after three days and three nights in the belly of the earth before his resurrection, he released those in this part of Hades. And those that died outside the faith remain in the other part, along of all those who are going to die outside the faith. They're awaiting the great white throne judgment that happens at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. We see it in Ephesians 4, verses 9 and 10. Now this, he ascended What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. You see, they look forward to the coming Messiah. Really, that's what all Hebrews chapter 11 is about, the the, uh, section on um, the men and women of faith. They were looking to the promises of the Messiah coming. We looked at the finished work of the Messiah. We looked back and were saved by grace through faith. Now, Jesus is the mediator, right? He's the one, the kind of the go between us and God. Sin had separated man from God. There's this big gulf. And so, mediator, you could say bridge builder. How do I go from here to God who's over here? I can't. But Jesus has come. He's the bridge builder. I come to him, and he brings me to God the Father. The old covenant can never save you. Jesus can, and he does. He's the one who's brought us to God. Verse 16 here in Hebrews 10. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all, while the testator lives. First of all, let me say this. The Greek word used for covenant in verse 15 here in Hebrews 10 is the same Greek word used for testament or will here in verses 16 and 17. 
Why is it translated into different English words? Very simple. In verse 15, it was used religiously, and thus the word covenant. Verses 16 and 17, here in Hebrews 9, it's a word that is used legally. And thus the word testament or will is used. And there's really good reasons. You'll see how this plays out. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Let's deal with this issue of the, this testament or will. What's Paul talking about when he says, a testament is in force after men are dead? Well, to understand what Paul is saying here, we need to think of a testament as being like the last will and testament. It is not in effect until when? When a person dies. Their will is not in effect until they die. Uh, think of it like this. You know, my, my children can't come up to me and say, you know, Dad, I'm ready to collect on your will. What do you got for me? Uh, I'm not quite dead yet. I, actually, I'm feeling pretty good right now. Sorry, you're not going to get it. You see, I have to die before they can receive what I have for them in my will. And my wife is first in line. And then the kids. And, well, she's not here tonight. So I do sleep with one eye open knowing that she is the benefactor of the will. So I, I just play safe. I'm in so much trouble when I go home because she's listening. But here's the point. The new covenant couldn't take effect until the testator, Jesus, died. After his death, the new covenant is established, right? Right? Spurgeon said, if there be a question about whether a man is alive or not, you cannot administer to his estate. But when you have certain evidence that the testator has died, then the will stands. So it is with the blessed gospel. If Jesus did not die, then the gospel is null and void. I hope that makes sense. And let me put it in perspective for you like this. If I'm the sole possessor of someone's will, all that they own is going to be mine someday. All of it. But right now, all that the person has are only a pr are promises that they've made to me. And once the person dies, all those promises become a reality. That's really like the Old Testament saints. They only had the promises, right? But when Jesus, when God became flesh and dwelt among us and went to the cross at Calvary and paid in full the penalty for our sins, when the testator died, the new covenant was established. And so the old covenant is gone. You can't have two wills. When I make a will, say down the road, I make a new will. What happens to the old one? Gone. It's done away with. Because the new one supersedes the old one. So it's gone. You, know, you, you can't say, well, I like this in the old one and I like this in the... No. The old one's gone. It's torn up, ripped up. You can't go back to it. Now, think about this. Jesus is not only the testator, but what did we read in verse 15 here in Hebrews 9? That he's also the mediator of this new covenant. Can any man be both? Think about that. Absolutely not. If it takes your death to establish the will being enacted upon, then you can't be a mediator because you're dead, right? It, it just makes sense. So no man could do this. But Jesus can. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross at Calvary, and three days later he rose from the dead. So he can be both, right? The testator and the mediator of the new covenant. And what has Jesus left us? Oh, one of the greatest inheritances ever. Eternal life with him. Wow. He's given us all the things we need in this life to serve him. We have more than we will ever need. Well, here in, in chapter 9 again, look at verse 18. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, 
and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purged with blood. And without shedding of, the bl- of blood, there is no remission. Wow. This is so important for us, to stand, for us to understand today because so many people are trying to deny the blood atonement. This is not an option, guys. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And we'll look at that in a, in a minute here. But look at how Paul explains it to these Jewish believers, something they knew, but they needed to be reminded of and shown what it all pointed to. How was the old covenant ratified? Well, Paul says it's by the shedding of blood. Blood was sprinkled upon the book, the people, the tabernacle, all the vessels of ministry. Why? Why was the blood sprinkled? Because the payment for sin is the shedding of blood. And the animal sacrifices looked ahead to the sacrifice that Jesus would make for us by shedding his blood. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission, forgiveness of sins. So the new covenant was also ratified by the shedding of blood, his own blood. The Lamb of God has come to take away the sins of the world. And according to the law, Paul said here in verse 22 of Hebrews 9, almost all things are purified with blood, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. None. And this was all symbolic. It pointed to Jesus Christ, and even this, you know, exception represented uh, a blood sacrifice because Leviticus 17, 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Isn't that interesting? The shedding of blood. And yet today, it's amazing how some see the cross of Calvary, the shed blood of Christ, as crude, as offensive, as barbaric, that God would never do something like that. Some of you may have heard of Paul Young's book, The Shack. I don't recommend it. Very bad theology. Um, It's getting kind of cold outside, so if you have it, you can use it for some kindling, I guess, but... Don't send me emails if you're mad at me. That's okay. Listen to what he has to say about the blood atonement. This is a radio interview with Paul Young. And he told the interviewer that he did not hold to the traditional view of the atonement in that he does not believe Jesus Christ bore the punishment, penalty for man's sins when he died on the cross. Well, what did he come to do then? He also stated with regard to this topic, I don't know if you're aware, but that's a huge debate that's going on in theology right now within the evangelical community. That debate to which Young refers is the new theology, or as we call it, the new spirituality, that is entering Christianity through contemplative and emerging figures such as Brennan Manning, Brian McLaren, Marcus Borg, and many, many others. Now here's the thing. Why is it a debate? This is not a debate. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. What are you debating? And yet we're debating it? This is their whole premise, that a loving father would never send his son to a violent death on behalf of the sins of others. And while they do not deny that Jesus did physically die on a cross, they insist that his death was not a substitutionary act wherein he was punished for our sins. Rather, they say he was killed by man, not for man. And he was a perfect model of sacrificial servanthood. Are you kidding me? You mean it was worthless? God became flesh, dwelt among us, was beaten so badly that his face did not even resemble that of a man anymore. They plucked his beard out. They beat him on his back that was just raw. They crucified him just to be an example of what sacrifice is all about. They missed the whole point. Alan Jones, Episcopal um, New Spirituality author, 
states, Jesus' sacrifice was to appease an angry God. Penal substitution was the name of this vile doctrine. So the blood atonement's a vile doctrine now. I don't think we realize how horrible sin is and what God had to do to save us. Liberal theologian, Pastor Harry Emerson Fosdock, said the doctrine of the blood atonement was a slaughterhouse religion, and he said it was a pre-civilized bar- barbarity. In his 1929 sermon, Shall the Fundamentals Win? And this is what he stated. It's interesting to note where the fundamentalists are driving in their stakes to mark out the deadline of doctrine around the church, across which no one is to pass except on terms of agreement. They insist that we must all believe in the historicity of certain special miracles, preeminently the virgin birth of our Lord, that we must believe in a special theory of inspiration that the original documents of the Scripture which of course we no longer possess, were inherently dictated to men a good deal as a man might dictate to a stenographer, that we must believe in a special theory of the atonement that the blood of our Lord, shed in a substitutionary death, placates an alienated deity and makes possible welcome for the returning sinner, and that we must believe in the second coming of our Lord upon the clouds of heaven to set up a millennium here. As the only way in which God could bring history to a worthy uh, conclusion. Such are some of the stakes which are being driven to mark a deadline of doctrine around the church. Absolutely! That's what we're fighting for. And yet they don't think this is important at all. Their line of thinking is that while Jesus going to the cross should be looked at as an example of perfect, perfect servanthood and sacrifice, The idea that God would send his son to a violent death on the cross is just barbaric, and it wouldn't happen. And so Fosdick and those who adhere to the reasoning rejects Christ as a substitute for our penalty. There is no atonement. Well, if that's true, then we are still dead in our trespasses and sins. Do you see how important this is? I like what G. Campbell Morgan said, and he nailed it. There's nothing, there is nothing cruel and offensive I see in the cross with its blood except your sin and mine. Yeah. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. What do you think those animal sacrifices were all about? The death of the innocent for the guilty. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together. Because they knew they were naked before God. Everything was exposed. That is man trying to work his way into heaven. And God didn't even acknowledge that because it was wrong. And what did he do? He slew an animal, and I believe it was a lamb. It doesn't say that. I just personally believe it was a lamb. And made a coat of skin for them to wear. You know, maybe the fig leaves... They're very irritating to your skin. And maybe they thought, well, you know, if I hurt, if there's pain, maybe God will forgive me. And God said, no. It's the death of the innocent, the shedding of blood for the innocent. And that's what Jesus did. The perfect sacrifice for the guilty. Wow. Jesus provided a way of forgiveness, and it's only through, through him. There's... You know, we hear today that people just want to talk about the love of God, which is amazing. I mean, God, the love of God is absolutely, absolutely, without a doubt, the most amazing thing in the world. In fact, in the New Testament, there's over 290 references to the love of God. Did you know? Probably don't. But in the New Testament, there are over 1,300 rough references to the atonement. 1,300. What does that mean? that over 1,300 times in the New Testament, God gives us an assurance of salvation that is at our disposal through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's that important. It's a matter of life and death, eternal life with him or eternal life separated from him. It's the answer to man's problem of sin. Spurgeon put it like this. He said, just kind of... In his uh, sermon, The Blood Shedding, he began by showing us three fools. 
And I'm just going to share that with you. The first is a soldier wounded on the field of battle. The medic comes to the soldier, and immediately the soldier wants to know everything about the rifle and the soldier that shot him. Really? Come on. The second fool is a ship captain whose ship is about to go under in a terrible storm. The captain is not at the wheel of the ship, trying to guide it through the crashing waves. He's in his room, studying charts, trying to determine where the storm came from. Who cares? The third fool is a man who is sick and dying with sin, about to go under the waves of God's justice, yet is deeply troubled about the origin of evil. We should look to the solution more than to the problem. Absolutely, the solution is Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Paul is trying to drive that point home. Those animal sacrifices were only temporary covering. Jesus has completely taken away our sins, past, present, future. Again, here in Hebrews 9, look at verse 23. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in, in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. You know, it was acceptable for the copies of these heavenly things, the tabernacle, later the temple, and all that went with it, to be purified or cleansed with imperfect sacrifices, these animals. But when it came to heavenly things, the only thing that could purify it or cleanse it needed to be a perfect offering, Jesus. And you think, well, wait a minute, heaven, why did it need to be cleansed? How was heaven defiled? you ever think about that? Why would it need to be purified? Well, you know, we're told in Job 1.6 that Satan still has access to heaven. He's the accuser of the brethren. And where did sin begin? In heaven. When Lucifer rebelled against God. Maybe that's it. Possibly. Look at verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. It's all summed up here. And if they didn't get it, Paul's going to make it very clear here, right? Jesus was crucified on earth, but his work continues on in heaven. He intercedes for us before the Father. And he died once for our sins, not continually, once. You know, I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church, and I'm not picking on the Roman Catholic Church, but I want to show you what they believe and how it goes contrary to the Scriptures. Our, the scriptures have to be our final authority, not what any man has to say. Ludwig Ott, who is a Roman Catholic theologian, made this statement in regard to the perpetual sacrifice dogma that was made official by the church at the Council of Trent in the middle of the 16th century. He said, The Holy Mass is a true and proper sacrifice. It is physical and propitiatory, removing sins and conferring the grace of repentance. Propitiated by the offering of this sacrifice, God, by granting the grace of the gift and the gift of penance, remits trespasses and sins, however grievous they may be. In other words, Jesus is still being sacrificed at every Mass. His atoning work on the cross of Calvary is not finished. It's not completed. And yet that goes completely against what the scriptures have to say. He put away sins once for all. That's what Peter said, 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He's the mediator, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Once for sin, not over and over. One writer put it like this. He said, This principle of sacrifice explains why the suffering of hell must be eternal for those who reject the atoning work of Christ. They are in hell to pay the penalty for their, of their sin, but as imperfect beings, they are unable to make a perfect payment. If the payment is not perfect, then it has to be continual and constant, indeed for all eternity. A soul would be released from hell the moment its debt of sin was completely paid, 
which is another way of saying never. Wow. That's why the sacrifice of Jesus, he was the perfect sacrifice, could take away our sins. Let's finish up. Look at verse 27. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. You know, if you don't receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior while you're living, you're lost forever. There's no second chances after you die. Once you die, you stand before the Lord either in your own righteousness, which are like filthy rags, and you'll be spend eternity apart from Christ, or the righteousness of Christ that's been imputed into your life by faith in him, and you'll spend eternity with him. Now, it says it's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. What about people in the scriptures like Enoch and Elijah? Right? They were taken up. They didn't even die. Others were raised from the dead, like Elijah raising the Gentiles' widow's son from the dead, or the dead man who was tossed into the grave of Elisha, and as his bones touched Elisha's bones, the guy came to life. Talk about freaky, huh? And Jesus brought back to life a ruler's daughter in Matthew 9, 25. He raised Lazarus from the dead in John 11. And what about those that are going to be taken to heaven during the rapture? We're just going to be caught up. We're not going to die. So what's up with that? The principle is still the same. It's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. That's the principle. Are there exceptions to that rule? Yeah, we've seen it in the scriptures. But don't miss the point. You need to be ready to meet your maker, right? And again, Paul is not specifically talking about reincarnation here, but we can talk about that because it's denying it. Reincarnation is successive rebirths of a soul into this life as the soul progresses towards perfection or salvation. If you're good, you're getting closer to the God state, and if you're bad, you know, I don't know, you come back as a duck or whatever because of the bad karma you brought in this life. You know, you're thinking, what a quack, right? Quack, quack, sorry. You won't hear that again for another 15 years, right? It won't take us that long to get back here, and I'm sure we'll be with the Lord before then, the way things are going. But isn't it interesting what people believe? Reincarnation. You know, years ago, my wife was at the, the post office, and there was an ant walking across the counter, and she smashed it. The guy goes, what are you doing? And he believed in reincarnation. He said, that could have been somebody's, you know, aunt. <laughs> I guess it was. How crazy, right? I mean, it's just, you scratch your head. But then when we say, you know what? Sin has separated us from God. You need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. They go, you guys are the craziest people. Come on. But... You believe in reincarnation. Wow. The Bible never teaches, you know, we live, we die, we live, we die, we live, we die over and over and over again. No. We have one life to live, and we face the judgment. And are we ready to meet our maker? Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. And we're living in the age of grace. And here's the wonderful thing. God is coming again. He's coming to receive his bride. I can't wait. But remember, he came the first time not to condemn man, but to save him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. We're already condemned. We needed a savior. But when he comes again, it's going to be for judgment. He's going to judge this world. He's going to pour his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. That's why... We should have such a passion to bring the gospel to the lost, this lost and dying world. They need Jesus. Let me share this with you and then I'll close. We're told, in short, the work of Christ is a complete at work, final and eternal. On the basis of his completed work, he is ministering now in heaven on our behalf. 
Did you notice that the word appear is used three times in Hebrews 9, 24 through 28? These three uses give us a summary of our Lord's work. Here they are. He has appeared to put away sin by dying on the cross. Hebrews 9.26 He is appearing now in heaven for us. Hebrews 9.24 And one day he shall appear to take Christians home. Hebrews 9.28 These three tenses of salvation are all based on his finished work. Praise God for that. Jesus is a better sanctuary And after these Jewish believers read these words, they had to clearly understand that there is no middle ground for them to stand upon. Either they receive Jesus fully or they'll go back to the picture. The Old Testament sacrifices, which will have them in bondage because it will never take away their sins. But Jesus Christ has come, completely taken away our sins, and we eagerly are waiting for him to return. And I pray that you're excited about that. You know, in the church today, we've kind of moved away of that excitement of the Lord's return. It should be one of the most joyous things. You know, our Lord is coming back. Paul in Titus 2 said, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. You know who's despising us today when we talk about the Lord's return? The church. You know, we're not to worry about that stuff. Whatever happens, are you kidding me? In fact, Jesus held the Jewish people responsible for not knowing the day of his first visitation. We don't know the day he's coming. But we know the season. And I don't know if you've been watching the news, but I think we're in the season. How long is it going to be? I mean, look at this peace deal that's going on in the Middle East right now. It is one of the most remarkable things. And I realize some people go, well, you know, don't divide Israel. Well, with this peace deal, they really didn't divide Israel. It's all the same right now, which is amazing to me. It's very interesting. The Antichrist will use this, I'm sure, for part of his deal with the Jewish people when he comes on the scene. But what's interesting, and I think Chris Quintanas did a masterful job speaking of this, is that this is a business deal. They tried land for peace, right? How did that work? Every time Israel gave land to the Palestinians, war broke out because they were within the borders of Israel. This is a business deal. And how it works is like this. If you want to be involved in prosperity, if you want some money, you need to work with Israel. Wow. The whole idea is, as these Arab nations that are joining with Israel now, when these people who are living in these the Gaza Strip and all these other, in these other areas where Hamas and Hezbollah, Hezbollah are working, these people are going to get upset. And hopefully they push out Hamas and Hezbollah because they want the prosperity that is happening now, not only in Israel, but now it's going to these other Arab nations as well. Remarkable plan. There will never be peace apart, though, from Jesus Christ. This is a temporary peace. And it's kind of interesting because the Bible talks about peace and safety. And maybe that's what we're seeing in Israel right now, this kind of peace, safety, everyone getting along. I don't know, maybe they're going to sing Kumbaya, I don't know. But then comes sudden destruction. Interesting. Again, we'll see how this all plays out. But... As one writer uh, of a song put it like this, people get ready. Jesus is coming to take from the world his own. He's absolutely going to do that. We need to let people know the truth, who Jesus is and who we are, because there are none good, no, not one. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. We need the righteousness of Christ imputed in our lives by faith 
and it only comes through Jesus. May we be a light in this really dark, dark world. Because, you know, when it's really dark and you turn on a light, wow, is that thing bright. And that's what we need to be. It's not time to diminish or hide our light. It's time to shine brightly. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, your encouragement. And Lord, how you've shown us that the old covenant is done away. Because Jesus Christ has come. And we have the new covenant that is found in his blood. And it's cleansed us from our sins and cast our sins as far as the east is from the west to be remembered no more. Thank you, Lord, for that. And Lord, may we just be able to share that message with others. Soften the hearts of the people in this nation, Lord, that they may see Jesus. It's the only hope, Lord. We see the violence. We see all the immorality going on. It breaks our hearts. Lord, help us never to give up on people, but to keep reaching out to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We love you and thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.